can't even think about it. It's like trying to look at your head. You know, you try to look at your head, and what do you find? You don't even find the black blob in the middle of things. You just don't find anything. And yet that is that out of which you see, just as space is that out of which the stars shine. So there's something very clear about all this, that that which you can't put your finger on, that which always escapes you, that which is completely elusive, the blank, seems to be absolutely necessary for there to be anything whatsoever. Now let's take this further. Kali also is the principle of death because she carries a scimitar in one hand and a severed head in the other. Death. This is tremendously important to think about. We put it off. Death is swept under the carpet in our culture, in the hospital. They try to keep you alive as long as possible in utter desperation. They won't tell you that you're going to die. They, uh, when their relatives have to be informed that it's a hopeless case, they say, don't tell this to the patient. And all the relatives come around with hollow grins and say, well, he'll be all right in about a month, and then we'll go and have a holiday somewhere and sit by the sea and uh, listen to the birds and whatnot. And the dying person knows that this is mockery. Well, of course, we've made death howl with all kinds of ghouls. We've invented dreadful afterlives. I mean, the Christian version of heaven is as abominable as the Christian version of hell. I mean, nobody wants to be in church forever. <laughs> Children are absolutely horrified when they hear these hymns which say, prostrate before thy throne to lie and gaze and gaze on thee. They can't imagine what this imagery means. I mean, in a very subtle theological way, I could wangle that statement around to make it extremely profound. I mean, to be prostrate at once and to gaze on the other hand, see, is a coincidentia oppositorum. A coincidence of opposites, which is very, very, very deep. But to a child, it is a crick in the neck. <laughs> and <laughs> that, that's the sort of imagery we're brought up with. So the idea of what might happen after death. Well, you're going to be faced with your judge. The one who knows all about you. This is Big Papa who knows you were a naughty boy and a very naughty girl, especially girl, from the beginning of things. He's going to look right through to the core of your inauthentic existence. And what kind of heebie-jeebies may come up? Or you may be, believe in reincarnation, and you think that uh, your next life will be uh, the rewards and the punishments for what you've done in this life. And you know you've got away with murder in this life. <laughs> And the most awful things are going to happen next time around. So you look upon death as a catastrophe. <laughs> then there are other people who say, well, when you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> Just no, nothing going to happen at all. So what you got to worry about? Well, we don't quite like that idea. Because it spooks us. You know, what's it be like to die? To go to sleep and never, never, never wake up. Well, a lot of things it's not going to be like. <laughs> it's not going to be like being buried alive. It's not going to be like being in the darkness forever. I tell you what, it's going to be like as if you never had existed at all. Not only you, but everything else as well. That just there was never anything, and there's no one to regret it. And there's no problem. Well, think about that for a while. It's kind of a weird feeling you get when you really think about that. You really imagine it. Just to stop altogether. 
And it you can't even call it stop, because you can't have stop without start. And there wasn't any start. There's just no thing. Well, then when you come to think of it, that's the way it was before you were born. I mean, if you go back in memory, as far as you can go, you get to the same place as you go forward in your anticipation of the future as to what it's going to be like to be dead. Then you get these funny ideas that this blankness is the necessary counterpart of what we call being. Now, we all think we're alive, don't we? I mean, we're really here? That there is something called existence? You know, the existentialist, the sign, throneless, you know, here we are. But how could you be experiencing that as a reality unless you had once been dead? How, what gives us any ghost of a notion that we are here? Except by contrast with the fact that we once weren't. And later on won't be. But this thing is a cycle. Like positive and negative poles in electricity. So this then is the value of the symbolism of she is black. She, the womb principle. The receptive. The instanding. The void. And the dark. And so that is to come into the presence of the God who has no image. Behind the father image, behind the mother image, behind the image of light inaccessible, and behind the image of profound and abysmal darkness. There's something else which we can't conceive at all. Dionysus the Areopagite called it the luminous darkness. Nagarjuna called it Shunyata, the void. Shankara called it Brahman, that which can only, of which nothing at all can be said. Neti neti beyond all conception whatsoever. And you see, that is not atheism in the formal sense of the word. This is a profoundly religious attitude. Because what it corresponds to practically is an attitude to life of total trust, of letting go, when we form images of God, they are all really exhibitions of our lack of faith. Something to hold on to. Something to grasp. How firm a foundation. What lies underneath us. The rock of ages or whatever. Ein Festeburg. But when we don't grasp, we have the attitude of faith. If you let go of all the idols, you will, of course, discover that what this unknown is, which is the foundation of the universe, is precisely you. It's not the you you think you are. No, it's not your opinion of yourself. It's not your idea or image of yourself. It's not the chronic sense of muscular strain, which we usually call I. You can't grasp it. Of course not. Why would you need to? Supposing you could, what would you do with it? <laughs> and who would do what with it? You can never get at it. So there's that profound central mystery. And the attitude of faith is to stop chasing it. Stop grabbing it. Because if that happens, the most amazing things follow. But all these ideas of the spiritual, the godly, as this attitude of must, 
and we have been laid down the laws which we are bound to follow. All this jazz is not the only way of being religious and of relating to the ineffable mystery that underlies ourselves and the world.